Hello everyone and welcome to episode seven of Life in Sport. Today we are talking about all things local sports partnership. Lots of jobs available in Ireland in this sector and I'm delighted to be joined by Deborah Foley who is the Community Sports Development Officer at Carlo Sports Partnership. Deborah, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining me on Life in Sport. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me, Yvonne. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to this as well, because this is a job that I don't know an awful lot about, actually. Um, And I suppose we'll start from the beginning, because I assume like I've read stuff about your career. I think it's important to point out we haven't met before. I reached out to you on Instagram um, when you told me about your, you know, your interest in the series and your own background in sport. And I just think your job is very relatable and that, you know, a lot of people, if they wanted to follow in your footsteps, it's very realistic. Um, But it does sound like it was a vocation for you. I'm just looking at, you know, your life all the way through your life. Sport has been so important. So just give us an idea into your background in sport. Um, OK, well, I suppose like everyone on this on this series so far, I've always had a vested interest in sport from a very, very young age. But for me particularly, I always felt that I was a little bit more interested in, in it in, in comparison to the other girls that I knew in my life. So, for example, in primary school, like I was playing soccer with the boys and putting on tracks of bottoms over my school trousers so we could do sliding tackles and we were allowed back into the classroom. And I just couldn't understand why the other girls that I knew weren't you know watching Formula One at the weekends that they didn't have their Jordan flag up as it was huge in the 90s that they didn't care that Man United won the treble in 1998 and I just I really struggled with should I be a girl should I be a boy I really struggled with my gender identity because I didn't know any other girls that were as vested in sport as I was so when I was about 11 years of age I had a huge crisis of gender cut off all of my hair you know thought I was a boy thought I was supposed to be a boy I went into secondary school, was severely bullied in secondary school to the point that I had to leave and go to another school. And I just didn't understand where I kind of fit in the world, you know, that kind of way. Is that all because you were interested in sport? Yeah, yeah, it was a big part of it. Yeah, very much so. And I just didn't, I didn't really understand where I fit in the world, if that makes sense. But I was always accepted by the girls that I played sport with. But I just couldn't understand why they didn't love sport to the extent that I seem to love it, if that makes sense. But then, you know, when you're from a rural community, your 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 peer group is very, very small. And it is very hard to find someone with this with the same interests as you that just lives two minutes down the road. So when I went to my new secondary school, I did find girls that were just as into sport with me, that they embraced their femininity, that they knew that they were girls and that was OK to be feminine and wear a skirt to a disco. But at the same time, go out and kill it on a camogie pitch. I ended up being in the same school and same class with Colette Armour, as you know, from oh, um, very good. Yeah. the camogie team. And like, Colette is a huge inspiration to me because she is a queen and she's savage, but she's still so beautiful and so feminine, you know. So I kind of discovered that, you know, it's OK to be a girl. It's OK to love sport and it's OK to go out and roughhouse it with the boys. But then at the same time, put on makeup and do your hair if that's what you want to do. My heart breaks for you, Deborah, because like I know what you're talking about, but like for you to have experienced that so young, like, I mean, and I think a lot of people, I think even when I started working it like on screen I used to wear like big bulky suits and stuff so that I yes. you know would look serious and wouldn't look too feminine and yeah. I was kind of afraid to wear dresses I've only started wearing dresses in the last few years and it's really oh, silly yeah. but I can totally understand where you're coming from but for you to have thought that at 11 or 10 yeah. it's heartbreaking like I I hope that wouldn't happen now I don't think it would I don't think so either particularly like to I suppose reference the toy show this year it was incredible you know the stories that those children had and that how fabulous their parents are and just how aware parents are now of all these gender issues that kids just really internalized then and probably still to a degree internalized now but for me it was it was very hard and my auntie was actually a huge inspiration for me she was the first female qualified mechanic in Ireland and oh, wow. <laughs> was, I thought she was so cool you know but she had cut off all her hair as well and I was like oh yeah like she's a little bit in a masculine trade like this is what I'm supposed to be doing because you know I'm not super feminine like I didn't have Barbies or anything like that when I was growing up I had tractors you know that kind of way so I really struggled to find my place in the world but then when I went to school in Kilkenny in Goresbridge I met a fabulous group of girls that were interested in sport that we still talked about boys and it was fab you know it was really 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 good but then that school ended up closing and I had to go back to the school that I was originally bullied in but oh, no. it was actually such looking back and it was such a big learning experience for me because I had thicker skin I knew who I was a little bit more I had a core group of friends and I wasn't afraid of the people that were mean to me anymore if that makes sense and I went into transition year and just absolutely loved life played on senior camogie teams won all our medal with Colette and it was just 
amazing you know it was amazing to to be able to face my demons at such a young age if that makes sense yeah I, I think you probably face them a lot younger than the rest of us did um the rest of us were kind of coming into them there in transition year and you had them all <laughs> sorted and boxed away oh, um no, you there. went on like you went, you obviously went on then and like even outside of your your job or your career you played into county camogie in football yeah. Yeah. Um, you stuck your like so sport was always there. You were a lifeguard as a teenager. You worked, you you got money for it for kind of, you know, your involvement in sport as well. Yeah, very much so. Um, so I was very invested in camogie and football. So to the point that I was training two or three times most days, like like most teenagers at that time were in their smaller counties, you know. So you're doing your club training and then you're into county training for football and camogie. And like that, there was a really strong core group of older women that were just fabulous and brought us everywhere we needed to go. But then on the flip side of that, um, Bagnestown swimming pool, it's an outdoor pool that's only open during the summer times. They're incredible. You know, I don't think that they get the credit that they're that's due because so many of us were upskilled as lifeguards from the age of 16. We had lifeguard work on the river. And if you didn't get on the river, you were able to get a job in a pool in either Carlow or Kilkenny because, you know, the counties are so close together. So it's a really small establishment in a really small town that provides so much education and upskilling for kids. And I loved it. I loved being a lifeguard, you know, to the point that I'm still qualified now. I'm making a point to stay qualified just in case yeah. I ever need it, you know, that kind of way. But like that really does instill a sense of responsibility when you're quite young. And also it gives you a really kind of good understanding of your landscape and to be aware of people around you and what they're doing you know because mm -hmm. there has been a couple of close calls and I have done a couple of saves thankfully no one but what has ever died but it does like it does really make you grow up quite quickly it's quite a serious job you know mm -hmm. so you must have then at that point you know in your late teens you know when you're thinking about what to do after school you must have gravitated towards something in sport yeah, and like it was the same thing as I think a lot of people here in secondary school. There's no jobs in sport. You're never going to get a job. You know, you'll be stupid to do this. You're really good at business studies and you're good at French. So this is where you should go. This is what you should do. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, all right. OK, OK. Because, you know, when your guidance teacher is telling you to go one way, you know, you're 17, 18. How are you supposed to decide what you're supposed to do with the rest of your life? And you're like, oh, this person is a grown up. They know exactly what they're talking about. I'll follow their lead. So I done that, got into, I think I was accepted into like aerodynamics and Carlo IT as a level seven. And then sorry, the, sorry, sorry, I sorry, sorry. Aer, aerodynamics, is that like airplanes? Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, airplanes are cool. Let's just put this one of my feet on. I have an absolutely no interest. Oh God, that's the best. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories about what to put in the CEO. Aerodynamics. I did not okay. accept aerodynamics. <laughs> Go on. Uh, then I put down business and French in WIT. And I was accepted and offered a place on that course. So went down to Waterford, like, you know, like everyone else looking to kickstart my life and was just desperately unhappy. You know, I was doing macro and microeconomics and I was like, oh, my God, what is this? And I obviously had a core group of friends like Colette and a couple of other people from school would have went to WIT and um, I, I played football with WIT. I didn't have time to play camogie as well. And I seen there was girls on that on that team that were doing kind of health promotion and sport and rec and all these fun things and I was like oh, what am I doing with my life and then I'd see them during classes and they'd be going out to do their sports pedagogy or doing their level one coaching in GA like so we're going out kicking footballs in college and I was like what am I doing sitting here <laughs> like something that I really don't like and don't see myself doing forever so I came home and told my mom that I wanted to transfer and of course that was a huge argy bargy here at home but I stuck to it and put in my transfer request and um, then the next year in 2008 I went back to first year in sport and recreation management in WIT and it was without doubt the best decision I've ever made in my whole life that very first day I was inspired by lecturers there was really strong women lecturers in sport um, like the likes of Aoife Lane and oh Aoife's brilliant yeah oh, Aoife's amazing yeah uh, Aoife she's not so kind though when you're hung over trying to kick by that she's like Deborah what are you doing you know <laughs> but, you know Lynn Brennan all these incredible incredible women that are so put together and so knowledgeable about sports landscape and I was just maybe it was just me that I had never seen that before but I was like this is what I want to be when I grow up I want to be one of these women you know and I just loved every single minute of it. I'd done my work placement. I graduated with distinction. And I, I really loved every four years or each one of my four years in Waterford. But then I kind of was like, oh, I'm not really sure what I want to do. And because I had gotten on so well, I was offered um, a master's degree in, I was kind of developing an algorithm for social media usage for NGBs and LSPs. 
so it was like it was early days social media was was a big thing but it was really just kind of starting to kick off like the FAI had just started their Twitter mm-hmm. account and that kind of thing so it was kind of learning how to use that as a tool for sports development. I'll stop um, you there in case people yeah. don't know NGBs are national governing bodies LSPs are local sports partnerships some people don't know and you know that's fair enough but just in case they get lost <laughs> in absolutely, translation. No, absolutely because so social speak- media so did you did you did you do the master's then or? Um, I started to do the master's yeah so I done 12 months I had most of the literature review done and I'll be perfectly honest I was driving down a motorway one day and I in my mind I was like okay if I just crash my car into the barrier just a little bit I won't have to go down to college and I can take a couple of weeks off this and then I was like oh my god this is a very scary thought this is not something that I want to be or this is not something that mm-hmm. I want to think of you know and I just kind of turned around and I came home and I had a really like really kind of good talk and a good think of myself that do I want to do this for the rest of my life is this master's benefiting me or is it taken away from me so I took some time away from the master's and in the meantime I applied for a a role as the um, Leinster Development Officer with Triathlon Ireland it was a part-time role and I was successful in that role so that was nice it was a really good distraction Um, I really really enjoyed it. it it was a pity it was my first job because it's such there's so much to do as a development officer and at the time they were way ahead of where we are now like that was a remote position and I just didn't feel when I was in the job that I had the experience that I thought I had you know that kind of way so I found it very difficult to engage with the NGB to engage with the clubs the way that I know I should have now looking back on it um and I was like this is making me happier than the masters is or was so I stepped away from it and let someone else finish it and then I was offered a role in because I was it was only part time and I was putting six euro petrol into my car. I'll never forget it. I <laughs> jumped down to, to Mullingar to be a club in my little micro, but it was fine. So I um, took up extra hours in the watershed in Kilkenny, which you know would have been previously Scanlon Park. It's a big yeah. leisure facility, running track and all the rest. Um, and I started as a receptionist there. And then I was offered full time hours as a um, swim teacher and lifeguard and receptionist and then ended up doing membership as well. So it was it was really nice. I learned an awful lot. Um, I left the job in TI when, sorry, Triathlon Ireland, when I was offered the full time hours because um, it was just more stable. And, you know, when you're younger, mm-hmm. you just want money and you need money. And I was so used to being a broke student for so long. I was like, oh, disposable income. Let me buy <laughs> I don't have to get six euro petrol anymore no, and get 20 yeah. we've all been there you only the credit card and take it back it was amazing it's all the world um so that was really I learned so much there but I kind of felt like I wanted more you know I I loved teaching exercise classes like I had the Kilkenny rugby team in one night for an aqua aerobics class and I was absolutely mortified but they were lovely these 40 big muscly guys in the pool of front of me dancing it was it was it was fun um, but I just felt like there was a little bit more kind of out there for me. So when I was in college, I had done a work placement in Alaska, um, up in Anchorage. And I was like, that was the happiest I had I could remember being ever in my life. So I was like, OK, I want to go back to being that happy person again. So I applied to volunteer with the charity again and I was offered a position. So in January, gosh, in January 2016, I flew back to Anchorage to volunteer with a charity called Hope Community Resources. And because I had been there before and because I was a little bit older and had my driving license and everything, I was put into a house um, with two guys that I was their their main, their primary care provider. Their names were Sammy and Josh, and they were amazing. I was just so lucky with the house that I was put into. Um, Sammy had severe autism and was nonverbal. And Josh had fibromyalgia and he was um, autistic as well, but they were both super, super active. So Josh was on the Special Olympic ski team. So I used to bring him up skiing on Saturdays. So he'd go off for his few hours and then I'd go off for my few hours and it was fab. And then um, Sammy actually worked in the military base. So he worked at night time. So in the morning times when he woke up about four o'clock, he loved to go for a hike before work. So I used to bring him, Sammy hiking. And it was just amazing. I had the best time. They were such fun guys. And so you found, so basically you you like, you like found yourself in Alaska again. Yeah. I mean, I know you had placement there, but you know, you decided to go back over there. And again, it's this active, you know, sporty lifestyle that yeah. um, you've seemed to carve out for yourself. It's like you're, yeah, it's like you're drawn to all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you stay I, there for long then? 
I, I had planned on staying there for a year, um, but I became heavily involved in the Alaskan handball community, which is when you say that to most people are like, Jesus, they play handball in Alaska. But they do. It's a huge, huge subculture over there. It's actually quite big in a couple of states in America and um, got really involved. The World Championships were meant to be there um, the following year. Um, so I was on the World's Committee and I was their PRO and communications officer and I got involved in the club and all those all those fun things. But when I was there, a role came up in Kilkenny Recreation and Sports Partnership. And it was actually a CSU role, but it was... Uh, it was Sean a what, Cahill. sorry? Sorry, it was my role. It was a community sport development officer. Okay, okay. You know, when yeah. you're used to speaking in the... In oh, the I know, business. don't worry. <laughs> um, and this so was in Kilkenny. This was in Kilkenny, exactly. Right. And because of the nature of Sport Ireland, some of the contracts, um, they are not permanent. They go on year or six month basis and that kind of thing. So I took a chance, interviewed over Skype, which they were very, very, um, very, very accommodating to do that because it was before Skype interviews for role yeah. had actually been a thing and da da da. So I interviewed really well and I was offered the position. So I actually came home to that role, which I was delighted to do because it was a really good job worth coming home for. You know, and I was kind of putting my eggs in one basket, thinking that the funding would be extended, da da da. But as it happens, when I came home, I was in the job a couple of months, and the national development officer for GA handball role was advertised based in Crow Park. And I was like, oh my God, this dream is job, me. dream job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like I had meant to go back to Alaska to get all that experience in handball, understand the landscape, understand the culture. And then this role came up. And you know, people say, when you, you're always best to apply for a job while you're in a job. So I think it really helped that I was actually in Kilkenny as a development officer applying for this role. So all my days, I was so nervous. You know what it's like when you pull into the back end of Crow Park and I was like, oh my God, where am I going? And I walked by the like the RTE suite and, you know, I think looking back on it, I actually ran into Peter McKenna on the corridor and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so I interviewed and I got past the first round and then there was a second round interview that I had to do a presentation for, you know, my first 12 months in the role. What would I do? Da, da, da. And I was offered the job the next morning and I was absolutely delighted, but super nervous because, as I say, I live super rurally, went to college in Waterford, which is a city, but it's not like Dublin or Galway or Limerick. You know, it is very closed and you know the people who are in your friend group and da da da. So I drove up and down for six months from Carlow to Dublin and I absolutely hated it. I put on weight. My back killed me. My mental health was suffering. So I was like, OK, I'm going to move up to Dublin. So I moved into Cabra, which was the biggest culture shock that I've ever had in my life. But I loved it. It was great, you know, and it was it was so nice to use the bus and to have pizza delivered to your house. It was a huge, uh, a huge uh, <laughs> <laughs> city yeah. living city living on. at its finest yeah exactly when you were can I ask you when you were in college yeah. um god you're you've you I barely I barely get a word in it's I'm great sorry, yeah. you have so much information <laughs> it's fantastic when I when you were in college though um I'm just trying to get a picture of where you wanted to work you know did you have in your mind I want to work for you know the GA or I want to work for um I don't know swim Ireland or an LSP like yeah. did you think about that when you were in college and did you have something that you know you felt you would have arrived at if you if you got to your your dream job or whatever that's actually a very good question yes I did um you know when you're when you're in college you're told that there's the, the three biggest um national government bodies so there's the GAA <laughs> the FAI and the IRFU and they're kind of on a pedestal. It's like, if you want a long-term sustainable job in sport, this is, these are the bodies that you need to try and get into because they will always be there and they have X amount of funding and a huge following and fan base, you know? Um, so I did, of course. And the GA was like number one. I was like, I want to work in Pro Park when I grow up. You know, this is, mm. this is it for me. And so when I get, got the job, I couldn't believe it. It was like, all my dreams had come true. I had reached my dream job at 26 years of age. And I was like, oh my God. I wouldn't be here forever. So when I started the role, like I say, I was driving up and down and then I moved to Dublin, which was the best thing I ever done mm -hmm. because it really, um, I suppose it freed my mind up and freed my time up and I was able to give more. You're just wrecked commuting. Anyone who's a long commute knows it's just not, it's not enjoyable at all. And with handball, it was an all Ireland thing. So there, it's a quite small national government body, even though it is part of the GAA. So there was only two development officers. So I was covering pretty much all of Ireland. And I loved it. Like I was driving to Cork, I was driving to Tyrone, I was driving to uh, Kings Court in Cavan for a lot of things. Um, mm. And having Dublin as a base for that was great because Dublin is quite central. You know, you can get a lot of places within two hours from Dublin. Um, but I just felt like, again, 
things were becoming a little bit stagnant. I felt like I was just facilitating school blitzes. I was helping clubs to the best that I could and I was helping some, I don't, I think that the athletes that play handball are very, very um, under-recognised on the Irish sports landscape. Like the females that are coming through there, like Martina McMahon and Katrina Casey are two of the top athletes in our country at the moment. And the guys as well, you know, Killing Card is living in America at the moment mm. playing handball. But even on the Irish landscape here like Martin McCurns, Robbie McCarthy like they're just incredible they're incredible athletes you know and they don't get the recognition that they deserve but that's part and parcel of being a smaller NGB it's just hard to break through the noise barrier of the larger associations you know so um it, I was fab I loved going into Crow Park half seven in the morning I ate my lunch at the Hogan stand you know making <laughs> taking snapchats making everyone jealous but like that I was there for two and a half years and just felt that there wasn't any there wasn't really any, I suppose, upward movement for me. I would have to move across into the stadium. A bit unsure about because, you know, when you love a sport so much, it's actually quite hard to work in that sport because you see the frustrations and you see the barriers and you see the red tape that come behind everything, mm. you know. So at the same time, at about two and a half year mark, when I was looking for different roles, my mom was diagnosed with dementia and she was only 58 when she was diagnosed. So, oh, wow. yeah, it was very hard. Um, you know I, it was hard leaving every weekend you know I just felt like oh geez what am I doing kind of leaving her on her own this week and that that because my sister had actually moved up to Dublin with me subsequently so she was on her own um so a role I was actually at home reading the Carlo Nationalist and I seen a job posting for a clear sports partnership and I was like oh this is interesting um it was to do with water sports and outdoor recreation which I had fallen in love with in college I sorry I should have said that I kind of moved away from GA and started doing individual sports and started kayaking and hiking and all those fun things mm. that we don't do in this country, even though we have incredible resources here that are like out the back doors, Mount Leinster. And I had only been up it twice, I'd say, as a teenager, you know, that kind of way. Yeah. Things that you just don't think of. But anyway, um, so I applied for the role. I was offered it again um, within a couple of days. So it was the community sports hub coordinator. So and sport- was this based in like Nace or somewhere? Excuse me. No, it was based in Athai on the River Barrow. Oh, on Athai. OK, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So the Sports Hub are an initiative by Sport Ireland that they've launched um, funding for them for pretty much every county, I think, has one now to try and like help people get their foot in the door within the sports landscape. But also it has a hugely positive impact on the communities that the sports and physical activity hubs are in. So there are some homes that are virtual in, I think it's I think it's Balbriggan in Dublin. There's a virtual hub, which means that they just organise classes and events kind of around the whole Bal- Balbriggan area. But there is no actual designated hub. But where I was in Athai, I was very lucky. The Rowan Club were incredible there. Um, they let me use their um, their clubhouse, which had a little office in it. So I was delighted with life going into my little office. In, <laughs> and um, so I set up kayaking. I, I set up um, some walk leader trails. Now, the best thing that I'd done in, in Kildare was... Um, I merged with a lady called Magellis Fenley from Leash Sports Partnership at the time and we done a walking intervention with um, the guys in rehabilitation in Coolmurra so it was a drug rehabilitation program and we done 12 weeks of walk with them walks with them and it like just changed me as a person you know I am from such a not privileged background but a comfortable background you know I have no experience with heavy drug use I have no experience with abuse of substances and that kind of thing and I was really nervous going in but like the guys they just come from such forgive me normal backgrounds and they just made one wrong choice after another wrong choice and then they just ended up in this life and started experiencing homelessness and it was amazing and that 12-week intervention saw an 80% retention in Coonmurra for the guys finishing rehabilitation whereas it would normally be in the 40s and that for me I was like this is helping people's lives you know all we're doing is going for a walk just listening to them and it's changing these people's lives so that's when I really found the love and the appreciation for the local sports partnership because it's not about sport. It's not about people who play sport now. It's about helping people engage in physical activity to better their physical health and their mental health. And you can have such a positive impact doing that. You know, it it sounds like there's a bit of collaboration as well. Like if you is there is there a network within Ireland? Like if you work in a sports partnership, is there a good network there with other counties if you wanted to partner up on projects? Because it sounds like there is from that project you did with the leash one. 
Yes, yeah, no, there are. Um, like we'll say, so for the, there's core roles in the sports partnership. So every sports partnership has a coordinator who's everyone's boss and every sports partnership has a an administrator that deals with finances and all that kind of thing. But then there's this um, social inclusion disability officer who's the person that caters for people with intellectual and physical de- disabilities and um, uh, they work on mental health programs as well. And then there's me, there's the community sports development officer. So between those four roles, yes, there would be a very open um, open line of communication but again it's a bit of picking up the phone being like hi my name is Deborah. can I be your friend and talk to you about these programs that I'm running in Carlo you know but I bet it always works though yeah oh big time yeah big time and there, it's nice like there is a little bit of kind of competition as to who's doing the best and who's the first to come out with a thing and da 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 so like I enjoy it I think it's really nice um, I felt as a hub coordinator, I didn't have that network of support. But again, it was just because I picked up the phone. I was like, hey, I want to run this program. Are you doing mm. something in Leash? Are you doing something in Carlo? You know? So how did you end up in Carlo where you are now then? Oh, sorry. Jeez, I'm really digressing. Yeah. So um, No, you're so- grand. I'm just interested to know how you ended up where you are, because you've obviously been on this. Like, I assume you would you would argue that every little step along the way has helped you in your current role. Absolutely. And it's so funny when people say that, you know, I'm not really superstitious or whatever, but everything does happen for a reason. And everything, like you say, that I've carved out and that I've volunteered to do and upskill myself in, everything has helped toward the next thing, you know. Mm. So you can never do too much to make yourself so attractive on as attractive as you can on a CV. So in Kildare, I um, was offered the part time position as Healthy Ireland coordinator, which came in. At, at around the same time as COVID so that was um, a much kind of higher level of work um, I was working with the Department of Health and I, was, I had my first meeting was with the Office of, of Antishock and I was like oh my goodness I'm not so <laughs> <laughs> but it went really well and everything was fine so um, when I was in Kildare about two and a half years again and I seen the role come up in Carlow Sports Partnership and Carlow's my home county um, it was a local authority role um, so some of the sports partnerships are housed by the local authority and some of them are limited companies so Carlo is within the local authority so I was like this is great I'm at home with Mammy um, I everywhere from my house in Carlo is about 25 minutes so when you're rolling programs yeah. it's great you know um, so I applied and I got the phone call I done a virtual interview um, with the coordinator from Wexford, Fran Ronan, who is a lovely person, but I was really nervous because she's quite a straight person. And I think it was me from the Trails Office in Sport Ireland and I interviewed and I got a phone call the next morning from Human Resources in Carlo offering me the position. So Sorry, can I just stop you there? Every job you went for, you got like within a day or two. That is not normal. I'll tell you the ones I, I, I applied for and didn't get. <laughs> <laughs> so like obviously now like you're in a local sports partnership again yeah um it sounds like you've kind of found your happy place um you know your skill set is really suited and um you seem to really thrive on the community side of sports Mm -hmm. which is brilliant because it means that you're in the right role um can I ask you for people watching who maybe would be interested in your job because it is so it's so varied as well um you know you do get a lot of variety in your role um and maybe they're doing recreation, sports rec in, or in college or whatever. Um, how do they make themselves um, attractive to a sports partnership or a national governing body? What are the things they should be thinking about in the back of their minds, aside from their qualification? That's fair. And I think it's, it, it, it is a little bit varied between the two. So let's say if you love GA and you want to be a games promotion officer, you need to upskill yourself as a coach. You need to upskill yourself probably within strength and conditioning as well. You need to upskill yourself volunteer hours with your own club and da, da, da. But if you are not sure what you want to do, don't put all your eggs in one basket, because I know as a sports partnership, if you interview for a role and all you have is experience as a development officer within the GAA, you'll be looked over for someone who may not have as much experience as you, but it's varied experience. So I think if you love a sport and that's your thing and you want to work in that and you want to be part of that NGB, then focus on that but be sure that that's what you want to focus on but if you want a more varied role and if you want to be attractive for Sport Ireland to work with them directly or for within the LSP unit I think volunteering is huge upskill yourself as a tutor in as many things as you can because so many of us have gotten in through into the LSP network as a tutor and the coordinators have seen oh this person's really good they have excellent communication skills they they deserve a job within the unit if it, if and when it comes up, you know. So that's the likes of sports hall athletics, um, badminton, basketball, all these things, all these programs that the sports partnerships roll out to make that first initial contact with them and to make yourself available for those roles, you know. Have you enjoyed working in um, an LSP 
more than in a governing body so like triathlon ireland or handball association because like, it is so different yeah, it's so different but that's the question that's going to get me in trouble now um no but... not at all it's a personal it's a personal choice sure. i you know everybody not everybody is going to want to be in the community and to want to be um, yeah. involved in having you know people who aren't necessarily sporty getting them into sports some people only want to deal with really really sporty people so that's just yeah. you know, that's that's the difference so how have what is the difference between working in one or the other or how do you find that you prefer the lsp the lsp um, you're right like as a personal point of view i prefer the lsp because it's so varied and yeah you have your calendar of events that are all going to happen every year like bike week and those kind of things but for the most part you can design your own programs you can identify in your community what's needed you can speak to people and ask them you know I'm a huge advocate of not about us without us so I think you should really talk to the cohort of people that you work with before you make any headways into making a program you know whereas with the NGB yes you are dealing with elite athletes on one hand and then you're dealing with grassroots on another hand but those kids that are playing grassroots their parents probably came through the same sport their parents mm. are probably into it and yeah you're right there's you're not motivating those kids to participate in this sport you know, they're doing it by choice. They're doing it of their own volition. And I really did enjoy working with the elite athletes. It was something like I was never a semi-professional athlete, you know, something that I thought I could be. But, you know, they say those that can't do teach. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think from my point of view, yeah, I, I prefer working within the LSB unit because I prefer seeing the real and tangible impact and change that you can afford to communities that you're working with. Do you think sport, and this is a big question, but uh, do you think sport has been um, a, like not not a safety net, but something that has been a comfort to you like right throughout? Obviously, you struggled with gender identity when you were very young. You were bullied mm -hmm. in secondary school. Um, you traveled abroad. And, you know, I, I think when you have the confidence to travel and work abroad, it, that, that confidence and that skill set is coming from somewhere. And I'm just wondering, is it? Is it sport that gave you that confidence? I think so. Yeah, I do. And like, I have no problem being led or being a leader. And I definitely think that that comes from sport because when you're winning, you know that, you know, keep your cool, just keep plugging away, keep going as, as best you can. And when you're losing, sometimes it is up to you to motivate a team. You know, sometimes it is up to you to make that shot, get that score or make that tackle. You know, I, I mean a situation comes to mind of getting my only ever yellow card in football but it had to be done you know <laughs> took one for the team took one for the team but yeah like it, it it definitely does I and for me growing up in the 90s I am used to having a male coach screaming at me on the sideline and telling me to motivate myself and that's how I I find it very found it very hard when I left team sport to motivate myself to be physically active. I'll be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. Like I really I have a huge respect for individual athletes because I even now like I'm not where I want to be with my physical health. But it's that motivation. I don't have it because I've always relied on someone else to get me moving. You know that kind mm -hmm. of way. Whereas I transferred those skills into my personal life because I know what I want. But it's hard to transfer those skills into getting yourself up to go for a run when it's raining, whereas I would have done 10 years ago because I didn't want to let anyone else down, you know. On the team, I totally on know the where team. you're going from. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. But on the flip side of that, I think that can be a huge deterrent for young girls, particularly, and boys, that are not able and don't appreciate someone screaming at them on the sideline. And I think that the NGBs have made huge inroads into changing how coaches talk and speak particularly to younger children to keep them vested in sports you know mm. well it's about enjoyment isn't it at yeah. that young age absolutely yeah and you know it wasn't for a lot of us but it <laughs> should be and it is now I think you know yeah I do think I mean I, I grew up in the 90s and well uh, well in the 80s and 90s and I do think that if you weren't into certain sports mm. ball sports mostly like mogi yeah. basketball football whatever um particularly at second level there was no sport for you really yeah. Um, and I think that's a problem because um, I, I, I actually think there's a sport for everyone, um, whether it's ballet or baton twirling or whatever yeah. movement of some description. I think there's something for everybody. And we're just we weren't very good at exposing young people, particularly young girls, to um, a variety of sports. So is that something that you've brought into the LSP? I think so. I and to be honest, I think that that culture has actually already happened. Um, like the school that I went to, um, 
the, one of the teachers there, she's actually a teacher when I was there, and she contacted me to ask, was there any chance that, or how would they go about putting in a permanent orienteering course within Boris Secondary School? And like, that's a huge, right. huge step forward, you know, and I know it might seem small from the outside, but it's actually a huge, a huge thing. And like that, you know, we're trying to implement programs like uh, meditation and swimming, which is going to happen on, uh, uh, during summertime in Bagotstown with Swim Ireland. And like I've done a program with um, IT Carlo that's ongoing at the moment. It's a research master's. There's two guys that are doing it and they're lovely, lovely guys. And we actually have 100 adults over the age of 65 participate in a 12 week resistance training program. And like these are proper kettlebell weights, like it's brilliant eight kettlebells, you know, and they're testing their mobility and their mental strength and everything uh, um, post and pre and post the intervention you know and I had my mom doing it now she was getting a bit muddled up and if anyone seen me I would be reported for elder abuse so I was trying to get her to show her how to do a kettlebell row but she still done it and she really enjoyed it you know that kind of way so I do think that the sports partnerships are really moving toward um opening up with with smaller NGBs and more varied sports like oh I, absolutely yeah I, I like I meant in the 80s they weren't but I think oh, now yeah, that you know that yeah. change has definitely happened and it's just so much better now for you know, for young people in school or even for people who are, you know, over 65 who, you know, yeah. probably need to get moving or keep moving or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, I want to finish up with some advice. Like, I mean, you, yeah. you've kind of you've kind of imparted a lot of advice already and a lot of wisdom. But um, if you could imagine being, you know, 18 again and being somebody like yourself uh, who kind of knows what they want, but doesn't know how to get there. And, you know, seem like it seems like there are a lot of barriers. Um, what kind of advice would you give somebody? Um, I think volunteering is a huge thing. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was always off doing something or volunteering somewhere with some kind of sports club or physical activity that I could. Um, I think it looks really well in your CV, particularly when you're younger and you're not going to have that much, you know, vocational or work experience. Like, how can you when you're 22 coming out of college and organizations are saying, oh, sorry, you have the qualification, but you don't have enough experience. Like mm -hmm. the only way to get your experience is to volunteer. And as I said, upskill yourself in as many things as you can to be a tutor for. So that way you are attractive to both NGBs and the LSP network and just take your time to find your path. Like it didn't fall in my lap. You know, like you said, I saw out everything I wanted to do. I had a clear tunnel vision that I wanted to work for one of the bigger NGBs, particularly the GA. And then there I was at 26 having, you know, I got my dream job and I was like, oh, geez, well, what's next now? You know, that kind of yeah. way. So it's OK to change your mind. You know, when I was younger, I told the whole world I wanted to be an archaeologist. And then I had a really scary dream about a mummy kissing me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is terrifying. I'm not doing this. So it's OK to change. Solid, life. solid life choice. Right. Yeah, I know. I think it was a premonition. But anyway, um, so it, it, it's OK to change your mind and it's OK to go to college and always think that you're a GA head and then you find kayaking or you find rock climbing. And that's your passion. Do you know what I mean? Don't put yourself into a box. That's the best advice I can give to anyone. So keep an open mind, basically, is keep what you're saying. Keep an open mind and volunteer. <laughs> keep an open mind and volunteer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Deborah, thank you so much. Um, you said you were nervous. I don't believe you at all because you are a great talker and you've given us a fantastic insight um, into the local sports partnership and that network um, and the amount of roles that are there to be applied for by people so thank you so much um, for coming on Life and Sport I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you I very much did and I have to give a shout out to Carlo Sports Partnership as well and Martha Jane hello I was told. Hello that. everybody in Carlo yeah. Sports Partnership <laughs> brilliant I hope they'll all watch it now. Me too. Um, Me too. Thanks a million talk to you soon Deborah. Yeah thank you bye bye. Take care.